Welcome to Forgotten Truth, a program of the Villarica Church of Christ with evangelist Patrick Gray, dedicated to reminding this generation of Bible truths long forgotten. Going back a few verses in Acts chapter 2, we read, Were they that gladly received his word, were baptized, and the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. In chapter 5 of Acts, verse 14, believers were the more added to the Lord multitudes, both of men and women. Again, we have a summary statement in Acts 6, verse 7. The word of God increased, and the number of the disciples multiplied in Jerusalem greatly, and a great company of the priests were obedient to the faith. In just a few years, we have this assessment made by non-believers regarding the advent of Christianity in the world in Acts 17, verse 6. These that have turned the world upside down have come here also. And we read these statements, summary statements in the book of Acts as we study church history generally, we can't help but be impressed with the rapid and phenomenal growth of the Christian faith in the early days of the Christian world. Within a generation, almost the entire Mediterranean basin had heard at least of the gospel of Christ. They had not all obeyed, of course, but it seemed like their word had gone to the ends of the earth in just one generation. Christianity was born in a hostile environment. There were many Christians because they confessed that Jesus is Lord who had their heads severed from their body. They were crucified. They were burned alive. They were fed to wild beasts for amusement in the arena. And they suffered gladly the loss of their lives. This in a world where infanticide, abortion was common. Where men could be shacked up with another man in unnatural relations or a woman with a woman. It seemed to be perfectly acceptable. But within just a few generations, abortion was illegal. Infanticide certainly was never countenanced much longer after the Christian church was born into the world. But then homosexuality was frowned upon. Marriage was exalted as God's word would have us live according to it. The world indeed changed for the better when Christianity exploded on the scene. Today, We do not read summary statements about the church in Villarica growing with multitudes of men and women being added to our ranks, do we? We live in a world where the Lord's church is present in many of our communities, and yet we're seeing the trend of the early days of Christianity going in the exact opposite direction. We were appalled, horrified recently to learn that your money, my money, confiscated by our government is used to pay for the distribution of intact human cadavers with Planned Parenthood promoting this horrific culture of death in our midst. And we're forced to pay for it with our tax dollars. We all should be outraged and horrified that that's happening here in the United States of America of all places. Our Supreme Court recently ordered all 50 states of these United States to recognize same-sex marriages, whatever that's supposed to mean. I mean, we, we could continue listing how the world is again being turned upside down, but this time in the wrong direction. Has the gospel changed? 
Has the gospel lost its power to transform our lives and the world in which we live? How do we explain the troubling direction we see our world headed? How is it that those early Christians were so successful? I'm sure we could list a number of reasons. One that stands out in my mind is for sure and certain they took their commitment to God and his church very seriously. How serious do we take our commitment to the church today? What is your view of the church? How do you feel about the church? We've been singing about it this morning. Beautiful song selection, by the way. I appreciate our song leader and the fact he went to great pains to sing, to sing songs that would certainly complement this lesson. We sing about it. Many of us occasionally attend the services of it. But how serious are we about it? Jesus said, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Matthew 6, 33. That's straightforward. There's nothing to misunderstand about that. The church, the kingdom of God, one of the same things, should have first priority in our lives as faithful Christians, children of God. Brother Eakley, others have studied have put together statistics and data that are eye-opening, to say the least. We try to get a, a finger on the pulse of just how serious modern Christians take their commitment to the church of Christ. Let's consider this. Brother Eakley says about 40% of the members of the body of Christ attend services on a regular basis. Now, when he says about 40% attend services on a regular basis, he means they're there at least once a month. Maybe once every other week. I've had a number of people that I've encountered, in fact, in recent days, older folks mostly, who say things like this to me. When I was growing up, we were at church Sunday morning for Bible study, Sunday morning for worship, Sunday night for worship, and we were back Wednesday night. We went to all the gospel meetings within a 100-mile driving distance. I mean, we were at church all the time. Two hundred and twenty-one is on the board in the back. It's 1125. At 145, I wonder what that number will be. We'll go to lunch. When we come back. I don't know about you, but things like that disturb me. It ought to disturb all of us. Can we not be more serious in our commitment to the Lord than to say, well, I'm just going to spend a couple of hours in worship. That's all. Just a And by the way, for those who do not return on Sunday afternoon, the sermons are generally a little shorter, meaner, harder, harder punch maybe, but it's really quick and to the point. And so you're not here that long, so it's really not even an hour. Is that too great a request? Remind me of the preacher. I've used this illustration before, but it certainly makes the point. I'll share it with you again. This preacher said, I've been an avid sports fan all of my life, but I quit it. I want nothing more to do with sport. And he said, you want to know why? Here's why. Every time I went, they asked me for money. The people with whom I had to sit did, didn't seem very friendly. The seats were too hard and not all that comfortable. I went to many games, but the coach never came to call on me. The referee made a decision with which I could not agree. I suspected that I was sitting with some hypocrites. They came to see their friends or what others were wearing rather than to see the game. Some games went into overtime and I was late getting home. The band played some numbers that I'd never heard before. It seems that the games are scheduled when I want to do other things. I was taken to too many games by my parents when I was growing up. 
I don't want to take my children to any game because I want them to choose for themselves what sport they like best. You know, we've heard those kinds of lame excuses before as to why I'm not regular, why I'm not here every time the doors are open. I don't know about you, but Hebrews 10.25 is still in my Bible, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as a matter of some is. You know, we really are living in troubled time when most people, it seems, get their knowledge of God, of spiritual truths, particularly about the church, on Facebook and other forms of social media, as though that's an authority on the subject. You've probably seen it spread around, those of you that look on Facebook. You don't have to go to church to be the church. What is that supposed to mean, anyway? And where's the verse and chapter for that in the Bible? You don't have to go to church to be the church. Well, there's so much wrong with that statement. I don't really have time to dissect it and go through it all. I will simply say this. If I am a member of the body of Christ, and I love God with all of my heart, mind, soul, and strength, I'm going to be present at the service of the church because, number one, he commands it. Number two, he loves me enough to give his son to die for me, and I'm going to do the simplest thing I can do in my power, be here to sing praises, to honor him, to honor his word, to remember this feast on the first day of the week. That's really not asking too much. Is it? Brother Eakley says, most members of the Church of Christ today could not tell you why we do not use instrumental music in worship. 75%, he said, could not tell you where the plan of salvation is found in the Bible. He also reminds us that from 1945 to 1965, we were recognized as the fastest growing religious body in the United States of America. By the 70s, we were ranked 12th. I don't think we appear anywhere in the top 25 anymore. I could ask simply, what's wrong with us? What's happened to us? Do we no longer care about these realities? When we see brethren who attend sporadically, when we know that our giving is not as it could be, you say, well, we're meeting our budget, perhaps. But with a congregation this size, we ought to be doing far more, and it should not be a strain on any of us. What is the problem? When we see an overall indifference toward the lost in our community, again, what's wrong? Why are we not taking the Lord's business, i.e. the Lord's church, more seriously? Let me ask you, why should we take the church seriously? I'll answer that question this way. Number one, because it is of God. It's his church. Actually, it's his body. It's his doing. You say, well, what's that got to do with anything? You remember what Jesus said when he was asked the question, Master, what's the greatest commandment in the law? You remember how he answered that? To love the Lord your God with all of your heart, your mind, and your strength. You mean God is to be loved that much? Yes. Well, think about the object of your love for a minute. If the church is of God, and indeed it is, I'm going to break this down, but if the church is of God, if it is of God, shouldn't I, as one who loves him supremely, be interested in what he's interested in? Shouldn't I care about what he cares about? Shouldn't I love what he loves? Indeed, I should. In fact, as the church, as a member of the church, I'm considered a member of the bride of Christ, married to Christ. Do I want to please my husband? Yes. Am I interested in what he... Well, let's think about this. Matthew 16. I say also unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church. Matthew 16, 18. Jesus built the church. Acts 20, verse 28. Take heed to yourselves and to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God which he hath purchased with his own blood. You mean the church means that much to Jesus? Yes! He built the church. He paid for it with his own blood. 
How can I say I'm a follower of Jesus and I love him more than anything else, but care little for his church? You can't think that way. In 1 Corinthians 3.11, for other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. In Ephesians 3, verse 10, to the intent that now unto the principalities and powers in heavenly places might be known by the church, the manifold wisdom of God according to the eternal purpose which he accomplished or purpose in Christ Jesus our Lord. The church has been in the mind of God from the very beginning of time, even before time itself. God envisioned the church. Everything relating to salvation is centered in the church. Religious division has done great harm to the view that many have today, particularly among our youth. It's reflected in the way they reason, the way they talk. It doesn't make any difference which church you belong to. Just find one that suits you. Where do you read something like that in the Bible? You don't read that in the Bible. People talk that way, they reason that way. I know that's a common perception today, but there's nothing biblical about that reasoning. What do you mean just find the church of your joy? Find one that works for you. God didn't grant us that privilege. You don't have to be in the church to serve God. Where is the book, chapter, and verse for that? I do know this. We can look at it from the other direction. When I serve members of the church, I am serving Christ. That's what Matthew 25, 31, the end chapter reminds us about. If I'm feeding those that are hungry, clothing those that are naked, visioning those that are sick and in prison, etc., when you do it to the least of these, my brethren, Jesus said, you're doing it to me. Well, I don't have to be in the church to serve God. There's no better place than the church to serve God. This is where we serve God, first and foremost. No church will save you. You know, it's easy to take phrases like that and build a doctrine out of it. It may be... In fact, true, no church per se in the sense in which it's being used will save you. But I know this for sure and certain. There is no salvation outside of the church. Let's look at Acts chapter 10. There was a good man. This kind of dovetails on the point I am making earlier about the common perception that people have. I don't have to go to church to be the church. Well, what does that mean? I think most people probably mean what we're reading in essence in Acts chapter 10, verses 1 and 2. Cornelius, a centurion of the band called the Italian band, a devout man, one that feared God with all his house, which gave much alms to the people and prayed to God always. I suppose we could look at Cornelius and we could say he was being the church without going to church, whatever that means. Let's think about Cornelius for a minute. Well, he was a man that believed in God. He was a man who prayed. He was a generous man who gave to the needs of others. He was a good person. In Acts chapter 11, Peter was justifying his actions in going to the house of a man that was uncircumcised to his fellow Jew. He said that Cornelius had shown him how he'd seen an angel in his house, which stood and said unto him, Send men to Joppa and call for Simon, whose surname is Peter, who will tell you words whereby you and all your house shall be saved. Wait a minute. This man was doing church without being a part of the church. He didn't have to have the church to serve. He might have been a good man. He was a good man. He was a devout man. He was a God-fearing man. He was a religiously oriented man. But he was a lost man. Because salvation happens only in the church. Think about it. If I can be saved outside the church, I can be saved outside whatever the church is. Well, what is the church? Well, for starters, it is the body of Christ. Ephesians 1, 22. He has put all things under his feet, gave him to be head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. You say, well, I'm covered with the blood. I don't need to be a member of the church. That's nonsense. The blood of Christ is in the body of Christ. Well, what is the body of Christ? It is the church of Christ. That's what it is. 
We need to think about what we're saying when we say these things. What does the Bible reveal about the church? Listen to Ephesians 2. That he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross. Well, where do I obtain the benefits of the cross? How am I reconciled to God? In the body. Well, what's the body? It's the church. If I can be saved outside the church, I can be saved as a citizen of the kingdom of darkness. There's only two kingdoms of which human beings can be citizens of. There's no middle ground. I'm either in the kingdom of God's dear son or I'm in the kingdom of Satan. That's it. There's no other choice to be made. The question is, which kingdom are we citizens of? Who hath delivered us from the power of darkness hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear son, Colossians 1.13. If I can be saved outside the church, I can be saved outside the family of God. If I tarry long, that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth, 1 Timothy 3.15. Well, how do I become a member of the family of God? The same way I become a member of my fleshly family. I'm born into it. Jesus said, except a man be born of water and of the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Notice that. Being born of water and the spirit brings me into... The Citizenship, it brings me into the family. I'm born again in the family of God. Made a citizen of the kingdom of God. All at the same time, by this rebirth process involving water and the spirit. Isn't that interesting? It just so happens in Colossians 3, 26 and 27, for we're all children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Galatians 3, 26 and 27. The same process that gets me into Christ gets me into the family of God. You can't separate salvation and membership in the church. Why should I take the church seriously? Because its nature is essential. I should take the church seriously because her work is profound. How did those early Christians succeed? Perhaps because they took seriously what Jesus said. But go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believes and is baptized shall be saved. Mark 16, 15 and 16. Someone said, for God so loved the world, not just a few. The wise and great, the noble and true. Are those of favor, class, or rank, or hue. God loved the world. Do you? Many fail in the task of evangelism because they simply do not love their fellow man. Perhaps more times than not, though, we fail in the task of evangelism, worldwide evangelism in particular, because we're afraid of what others might think of us. We live in a really weird world and time. Normal is abnormal, abnormal is normal. And so if you take a stand for what's right, you're a mean person. You're the bad guy because you're standing up for what's right. You're standing up for traditional families? Really? You think marriage is between a man and a woman? You must be hateful. I mean, you're you're just hardcore, aren't you? I'm not yet, not yet, 50 years old. And I can say that in my short lifetime. I didn't believe I would ever see the time when I would have to critique the direction of our culture in this fashion. It just seems so far-fetched, even to my mind. I'm still in shock. I'm still trying to get my mind around what we're presently experiencing. I can't believe it. It's just, my mind goes into disbelief. Seriously? We're having to, we're now having to defend the definition of marriage So if if we preach the gospel and we insist that people ought to be married who are of the opposite sex, well, that's mean-spirited. You're homophobic, right? If we preach the undenominational nature of New Testament Christianity, well, you're so exclusive, man. You you think you and your little bunch are the only ones going to heaven. We don't want people thinking that about us and saying those kinds of things about us, so we just don't preach it anymore because we don't want it to be unpopular. You know, the thing that we've forgotten along the way is that the gospel makes some people glad. And it makes some people sad. 
And it makes some people mad. It always has. And it always will. We don't need to lick our fingers, stick in the air and say, well, I hope I don't make anybody mad by preaching this. We simply have to preach the truth. The whole truth and nothing but the truth. I don't want to offend anyone. I don't want to hurt anybody's feelings. I don't want to make anybody mad. I want to do everything I can in my short lifetime while I'm here in this sojourn to turn as many people as I can to the one and only Savior, Jesus Christ, and to the one and only church he purchased with his own precious blood, the church of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. What else can we do? Time is short. Matthew chapter 9, 37. Jesus said to his disciples, The harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. Pray therefore the Lord of harvest, that he will send forth laborer into his harvest. When we begin to take the church seriously, we will take the task of evangelism seriously. I was greatly encouraged this last week. Came to class on Tuesday night, found two brothers that drove all the way from Alabama. More than an hour drive for one of them, I know, to be in our class. Training and studying to be gospel preachers. I understand on Monday night, there are other preacher students that are driving great distances. That is greatly encouraging to me. What we've been hoping to see all along. As I look around this audience, I realize we have potential for preachers and elders and deacons right here in this congregation. Let me urge you to prepare yourself. Not that you have to be a preacher recognized as a pulpit preacher or whatever you want to describe people like me, but you don't have to be one of those to do the work of evangelism. You have to be a child of God period. That qualifies you. That requires you to be an evangelist. What about you? Are you taking your commitment to God and to His church seriously? You know, we talk about, we all wring our hands. I know when the last amen is said and we're gathered in the highway talking to each other, we'll be crying on each other's shoulders about how bad things in our world are. It is bad. Getting worse. What are we going to do to change it? What are you going to do? You can change yourself by gospel obedience, believing with all of your heart, Jesus is the Son of God. Repent of your sins. Confess faith in Him as the Son of God and be buried in the grave of baptism. To walk, to rise to walk in newness of life, serving in His kingdom. Are you subject to heaven's invitation? Can we help you in any way? If so, Please, make that need known right now while together we stand as we sing. For free study helps, Bible questions, or comments, please call 770-459-3478 or write to Villarica Church of Christ, 515 Dallas Highway, Highway 61, Villarica, Georgia, or visit our website at www.unityinchrist.org.